All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are back for another Boca Podcast episode. And uh, I'm joined today by a brand new guest who, by the way, was willing to do this kind of last minute for us. So thanks to Taylor Ford for making the time for the Boca Podcast. Thanks, Taylor, for hanging out with me today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And and we only got the chance to, to chat briefly um, before we started recording. I, we may have just chatted briefly in passing at a recent conference, but I'm going to kind of get to know you along with our guests as we're talking today. And then we're going to dig into a pretty relevant conversation. I saw a comment of yours in a Facebook group, and I was like, oh, man, we need to get Taylor on the show. And you were so kind and gracious, willing to do so. And so here we are. We're going to actually talk about how to serve our clients right now admits kind of fearful times or apprehensive times, shall we say. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit annoyed, to put it lightly, with the way that the media is using all these drastic terms, so I'm trying to, to avoid that. But uh, the reality is, there is we all have this sense of apprehension in some form or fashion as we're dealing with the fallout from the coronavirus. And we're going to talk about proactive ways in which you are engaging with your clients or potential clients amidst Uh, what seems like chaos. And uh, we'll get to that in a little bit more detail in a second. But I mentioned getting to know you first. Just briefly, if you will, tell us where you're based, what market you're based in, and what type of photography or photographic services you offer. For sure, for sure. So um, I currently live in a really small town in Ohio. It's called Van Wert. So we're about um, about an hour and a half south of Toledo, about 40 minutes east of Fort Wayne. My market, really, I started photography about eight years ago in the Fort Wayne market. And it has since now I'm all over the place. I'm in Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati. So I'm really kind of all over. Van Wert just happened to be the best little little meeting spot. <laughs> yeah, kind of a central location. So do you find yeah. that a lot of the photography you're doing involves some type of travel? I do. I think about 75% of my venues are or venues that I go to on the every weekend or venues that I've never been to before. Wow. Um, traveling all the time. I have a new car that I think I got three years ago and I'm at 80,000 miles. I drove it off the lot with 12 miles on Whoa. it. So we've gone pretty far. But I hope you're tracking fun. that mileage for, for the tax write-offs because oh, that, sure. that'll help yes. you for sure. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so talk to me then as and you, you mentioned, did you mention how long you've been in business now? So in business for myself for about four years now, Four years. but before this, I was independently contracted while I was going to college. So it's really, really? Now we're, we're eight years in. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. That's really awesome. Yeah. And would you, I mean, being in wedding photography, it's uh, an interesting, it can be an interesting challenge, especially when it comes to customer experience. Mm-hmm. Will you share with our listeners, one of the most important principles that you found has made a big difference in customer experience? For sure. So really kind of guiding them, helping them, or I guess showing them what they need from a wedding standpoint, and then listening to their needs and wants as well. So a lot of times this is their first time getting married. So they're not really sure, do I need eight hours? Do I need 10 hours? What does that look like? What is, um, you know, a coffee table, wedding album? Really, what do I need from that standpoint? And then, you know, having them say that their their friends maybe had wedding photography with a second shooter. Um, so really listening to what they need, but also offering them what they need as well. Yeah. Two words come to mind, two E's. I, I grew up in a in a missionary family, actually. So I hear a lot of alliteration, um, going to church and this kind of thing. And and so two E's come to mind, a little bit of context there, um, education and expectations. Mm-hmm. And in some ways they kind of go hand in hand. The idea of creating expect or setting expectations as to the experience that you provide and then sure. educating them as to how um, your, well, first of all, how their day may, may go down most effectively as, as it relates to wedding photography or the services that you offer, considering that probably most of these people don't, haven't, number one, been married before, but don't necessarily have context to all the details associated with a day, especially as it relates to the schedule, um, enlightening them, educating them in that regard, yeah. and ultimately managing their expectations. It seems like that's a big part of what you're emphasizing, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So just really educating them um, from beginning to end, whether that also be help with the vendors or um, just like crafting their timeline for them. A lot of them just need that help and guidance so that they can, they can, I guess, take their wedding dream and put it into reality. Um, You mentioned wedding timeline and we've been working on an app called Milu. And for anybody that's curious, if you just go to MILU.com, this app is really largely designed for photographers and coordinators to create, manage, timeline, shot lists, kind of share that with their their clients. But what does that process look like for you? Do you use like Word docs, Google docs, just email? Or are you getting on the phone and meeting about it? What does that process look like? 
Um, right now we're either meeting at coffee shops or just getting on a FaceTime and kind of going through what time they would want to have their ceremony, what time reception starts. Um, but I also have a bridal guide that I send out to my, my brides based on an eight hour, eight hour wedding day. So it kind of says, you know, if you have a first look, this is how your timeline should go um, super smooth. And sometimes we can just take that timeline and use that exactly that. And other times we have to tweak it just a little bit. But, you know, it's all based on kind of a wedding day that has already worked out perfectly and then tweaking it to everybody's their needs and wants. Do they tend to give you like this list of shots or an idea of a timeline or are you usually the one that's making suggestions to them? It depends. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, Some people have had friends that, you know, they have full shot lists that they want. We'll go from there and I'll kind of tweak it, making sure that those shot lists are exactly what they wanted um, in the first place or whether it's just a suggestion that they had received from a friend. Yeah, it's kind of varies from client to client, maybe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Sure. For sure. Yeah, I, I know that that process can be a bit tedious. And that was kind of the idea that we had with with or one of the ideas that we had with the app was let's simplify this because it, it ends up in so many different places, so many different platforms. They mm-hmm. come with ideas. Of course, we have ideas based or that are based on our experience. Mm-hmm. And um, simplifying that process was the goal. But I appreciate that context. Talk to me about brand position, though. Um, this is something we talk about quite a bit on on the Book of Podcasts. And you and I were actually chatting briefly before we started recording about the fact that you're actually getting ready to to kind of dial that in a little bit more for yourself in, in context of the market or markets that you're in. But how do you currently position yourself in those markets as a wedding photographer? I'm assuming there's quite a bit of competition there. Yeah, for sure. So right now, you know, timeless, genuine, and fun are really what I want to give my clients. So that's, you know, at their engagement session, I'll make them maybe shout um, their favorite body part of the other person so that they really just get a little uncomfortable, but they let me (laughs) Um, So it's one of those things that at their engagement session will go deep into, you know, things that allow me to break down that paparazzi feeling. So on the wedding day, they just are like super open to giving me their genuine self and their genuine love. Um, And then making sure that I'm photographing that in a timeless way so that when they're putting these on their on their walls, they're going to last, you know, the, the colors and things are going to be more of a, a timeless feel for them. Mm. Um, but then fun is also what I really want them to take away from every session or every experience that they have with me so that, you know, the groom goes home and he's like, you know what, that was actually pretty fun. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, it's, it's funny how a simple idea like that, not only stating it, cause you know, saying it's one thing, and it became really popular, actually, in our industry for a while to have these three words and kind of put them out there. It's easy to say the words. It's another thing to actually follow through on them. And that's you know part of establishing a strong brand position is actually following through on what you mm-hmm. say you provide. Um, I love that you do that. And it really makes a big difference, especially with the groom. For the for those listening out there, if you go to taylorfordphotography.com, um, you can see Taylor's website and and to your credit, Taylor, above the fold, timeless, genuine, fun. Um, this isn't so much a brand position as, as a kind of a description of the type of experience that you're providing. The subtext under there, I l- kind of like this, the way photos should be. Um, I like that. And it's very playful, which is which is great for the, cl- the end client as well. What does it look like? I mean, aside from you mentioned having them mention their favorite body part of their partner, which I think is, is hilarious and brilliant. Are there certain other things that you do to create that fun atmosphere? Yeah. So um, a lot of times, depending on you know the feel that I get from them at the beginning, I will always make sure that the groom maybe has um, a drink before. A lot of times <laughs> they may just need a little, a little drink to just kind of ease those nerves. Yeah. But I also make them at least have two outfit changes. Mm. So that way that first outfit may be a little bit more formal okay. and then the second one be a little bit more casual. So that way they have that kind of you know, we're, we're riding a roller coaster throughout the engagement session. So it's really one of those that we have to break that, that wall down. So when the wedding day comes, they kind of feel where they, they, they feel like they know where they should put their hands in certain positions, but really it's, it's a lot of just having fun and having conversation and getting to know them during the shoot so that they feel comfortable with me. So when the wedding day comes, I'm not just another vendor that shows up. I'm really a friend. Um, that really, it makes such a massive difference and, and it should go without saying at this point, but if you're a wedding photographer, you're listening in or watching and you're a wedding photographer, if you're, if you're not doing some type of portrait session, engagement session or otherwise prior to the wedding, you're missing out on an opportunity, not only to, first of all, develop or begin to develop a relationship with these clients, 
But to Taylor's point, it, you really do help the client become more comfortable being in front of the camera. So on the wedding day, if you're you know, just crunch for time and you have 10 minutes to get the portraits in for the bride and groom, they know how to work with you. It makes it so much easier. And uh, so that's, that's really wonderful that you, that you highlight that or that you make that effort for the sake of the client at the end, because it's not just about the actual portraits, the images that you can provide them from that engagement session. It's about the complete experience. Yep. That's really, really good. Well, again, for everybody listening in, if you go to taylorfordphotography.com, you can see Taylor's work, which, I mean, even just looking at that first image, Taylor, you talk about timeless and you know the processing isn't overdone it ha- doesn't have some weird effect applied to it that's going to look irrelevant in five years um, and i love that about about your work that's displayed there as well thank you just a shout out as well for taylor's instagram for anybody curious of course we'll put both of these in the show notes if you just go to taylor ford photo you can see taylor's work there on instagram as well but let me keep going talk to me about time uh, you told me that you've been married for about a year and a half now. And so yeah. not only are you a business owner and a relatively new one, but you're also newly married. How do you juggle business relationship with your significant other? Make time for yourself as well. Is there a particular workflow tip mm-hmm. technique that you can share with our listeners? Yeah. So my husband and I are very fortunate. He works second shift. He's a, a police officer. So wow. it's nice that, you know, in the morning we're able to spend time together, but then cool second shift. He goes to work. I go to work. Um, but he's incredibly understanding Mm. with, you know, my, my very strange schedule, um, (laughs) as as self-employed people, we are, we're working constantly. It's hard to kind of separate together, but, um, he also really likes helping me. So a lot of times he'll come to the engagement session or he's also, um, my second shooter. So we, we get to work together and it's, it's been a pretty easy transition, which is, Kind of crazy to say. Well, I know I was going to say, so that's not necessarily the the most normal thing. Uh, I photographed with my partner for years. And while there were certain things we did great together, there were also certain challenges too. What what would you say has made that transition easy? I mean, internally, especially with regards to your relationship, the way mm-hmm. that you engage with each other, your perspective going into, you know, even conversations in a situation where maybe naturally you'd be frustrated because um, the other person missed the shot or they were doing this weird mm-hmm. thing and you're like, what in the world? And like, how do you, I mean, this is a loaded topic, but could you sum it up with a couple of points that have made a big yeah. difference in being able to work together really well? Yeah, for sure. So it's really kind of telling him what I need from the wedding day and just okay. being like, these are the things that I need you to concentrate on. Yeah. He really also helps to get, get the groom out of the shell as well, especially if we have never met the couple before. Okay. But you know, just in his field of work, being a police officer, he um, really enjoys wedding days because he really gets to see someone's happy day for once. It's a whole different experience for him. So with that, it really, I think, has made the transition a little bit easier because it's a whole different experience for him. But the thing that I heard you highlight there at the beginning, which is, is, again, it seems almost understood, but I don't think we can overemphasize it. You manage expectations. Mm -hmm. with regards to working with him, you say, this is what I'm looking for. Because I think a lot of times in relationships, and and I'm still finding this is something I have to kind of learn and and whether it's personal relationships or professional relationships for that matter, we, we, we do this weird thing as human beings where we kind of assume that the other person knows what we want or that they should know what we want. And so there's not clear and concise communication to manage those expectations. And as a result, they're I mean, you see frustration on, but in, mm-hmm. you know, from both parties potentially. So I For love sure. that you're doing that proactively. For sure. I mean, we've definitely had times, especially during family portraits yeah. where we're like, oh my gosh, or like during, um, during a wedding day where we're going through all of those family formals and it, sometimes we just get a little bit nippy with each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah, for sure. But both my parents are self-employed. So I grew up kind of seeing that lifestyle and really seeing, I guess, what needed to happen. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Again, proactively managing expectations. We could literally stop the podcast right now. And for everybody listening in, whether it comes to your personal relationships or your professional relationships with your clients, with coworkers, third-party companies that you might be working with, Managing expectations is a huge, huge thing. We see this on the the side of photographers edit as well. When it comes to photographers delegating or outsourcing their editing, a lot of times there's just kind of a weird assumption that we know we should know what they want. 
And so we see this firsthand. And by the way, I can empathize with it because I'm guilty of the same thing. But when it comes to building a scalable business, if you're going to begin delegating work, um, it's not natural for us to learn or to to communicate what it is that we want effectively to a wide variety of personalities. It is something we have to learn to do. Um, but it starts with just doing it, just just having the conversation. I love that you highlight that. And that's a great reminder for everybody. Talk to me, speaking of, about delegation mm-hmm. or outsourcing. The terms are in some ways just kind of interchangeable. Do you, is there something or some things that you delegate in your business currently? And has that made a big impact on your business? Yeah, for sure. So in 2017, I was in the middle of a move. I had so many weddings and editing was taking a very long time and I had no time for anything. So that was when I found Photographer's Edit and that really changed my whole life, my whole game, everything. I got so much time back. I was able to move. So, you know, definitely outsourcing to Photographer's Edit for all of my wedding editing has been a game changer. 100%. And I have to, by the way, I have to jump in and say, this was not a setup. <laughs> no, no. In not fact, when I reached out to Taylor, she was like, by the way, I've been using you since 2017. Thanks so much for photographers that it's made a big difference. So th- no, by no means meant to be a setup. But if anybody is curious, it's just simply yeah. photographers <laughs> I'll at least throw that out there. Uh, but sure. you were saying, please continue. Yeah. Um, and then we met this woman who cleans our house. So that has been a massive thanks. Anybody who works from home knows that having a dirty house really changes just your workflow. You see like dishes that need to go in the sink and you're like, okay, I got to spend, you know, time doing this. And then the floor needs swept. So that's another, you know, hour of your time. And it's just, uh, that's been a huge game changer. It really makes a difference because it frees you up to focus on, I mean, it could be more work things. It could be just being able to sit down at the end of the day. And because I, I don't know about you, but like at Eat five thirty six, whatever rolls around, and you're done with work, and you're like, oh, that, like the last thing that you want to do is now go spend an hour cleaning the apartment <laughs> or the house or whatever the case might be. Having somebody come and take care of that for you at a price point that's certainly more than worth our time um, mm-hmm, when we actually sure. look at the math of it. I think that's a really great thing. I've I've experienced doing the same thing. We had a lady for quite some time actually was coming to clean the house, and it was a massive help. And there was a part of me being a parent too that was like, I, you know, I don't want to miss out on the opportunity to teach my kids what it means to take care of the house and the discipline and the structure associated with that. But the trade-off, first of all, I could teach them those principles in other ways. And secondly, Mm -hmm. the fact that they didn't have to do those things or we as a family didn't have to do those things meant that I had more time with them. So I I think it was worth the so-called trade-off in in that instance. So that's a great reminder for all of us. Did you find that person? Was it like just a con- personal contact of yours or did you go searching for them on Craigslist? How did you find them? She's actually been cleaning my family's or my grandma's, my parents' house for a long time. And it was kind of like, hey, you know, how are you doing? Do you have a little extra time in your schedule? And yeah. So it's really been, oh gosh, she's amazing. I love having her. <laughs> That's cool. She leaves and just, I get to leave my office in the day and I'm like, oh my gosh, the house is clean. I get to go about my life. Yeah. Like, wow, all this time back. <laughs> That's awesome. Talk to me about inspiration. I mean, this is a word that we hear thrown around quite a bit in the photo industry. Um, and yet, as I've mentioned in the podcast before, I think there's a tendency for us to just kind of stay like blinders on where we're, we've got our phones and we're in our Instagram feed and that's we see photography as inspiration. It can be inspirational, but do you go anywhere outside of photography to find inspiration that that helps you, encourages you in your business? Yeah. So magazines are huge. Mm. Even like online shopping, you get to see the way that people pose. American Eagle is one of my favorite places to look for, for really? for like high school seniors. Yeah. Um, they just have a whole different style of photography. So I love just kind of looking for them for like posing inspiration or things like that. Yep. A lot of times I like, you know, vacation. Vacation really inspires me. Sometimes it's just getting that plane ticket and going someplace um, that really changes the game. California, for example, is just like, holy cow, just sometimes you just need to, or especially I just need to, whether it's going to the lake or California or wherever, just step out of, um, out of this, this busy business world and just kind of separate myself for, you know, a day or 20 minutes or whatever it is just to kind of reconnect with, you know, myself, my brain, creativity, everything Mm -hmm. kind of jump back in. Well, and especially with that weather too. I mean, Indiana, I know has a range of weather, but to be able to go to California and have the lack of humidity, sun consistently, oh, it is, it is quite invigorating. I, I have a hard time 
making sense of the prices that people pay for homes out there. <laughs> at the same time, I'm like, but I kind of get it because yeah. you have this weather all the time mm-hmm. and I'm so jealous of it. I live in yeah. Tennessee. I think, I think Indiana and Tennessee have some similar um, mm-hmm. experience as far as weather is concerned. And so, although I, I think you all end up having more cold than we do, but man, oh, yeah. yeah, to take that break and go to Santa Barbara or LA or San oh, Fran gosh, or whatever yes. is so, so nice. Um, mm-hmm. you mentioned magazines. Is, is it the visual component of magazines that you find most inspirational? What do you find most inspirational there? Yeah, definitely visual. A lot of times they just have information too. That's yeah. totally different. Um, whether it be, you know, on meditation or just, mm. um, cooking, cooking's yeah. like incredibly inspiring. I think okay. it's all the colors that you get to mix together. Um, but just kind of taking myself out of my, you know, the business going on in my head all day yep. and just separating myself and seeing like a totally different day. I don't know, Martha Stewart living, like that's my favorite magazine. I was going to ask. So yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. You know, what's mm-hmm. interesting too, I think th- there's something you mentioned the significance of going outside of our business. That's important just to begin with. But then I, I think that a really important component of intelligence is the ability to be able to make association. Um, mm-hmm. It's one thing to know information, but if you don't know how to use that information, then what's the point, right? I can be so-called book smart, but if I don't know what to do with that information practically on a day-to-day basis, why does it actually matter? But Mm -hmm. if I am able to take an information, make associations between whatever it is I'm doing now and that piece of information, there's a certain amount of intelligence innate to that. I mean, look at at the the people that have made the biggest impact on the world, at least a big component of their ability to do so is their ability to make an association between a need and an idea, first of all, just on a very basic level. And so associations are interesting. And it's funny how something like that might seem as random as Martha Stewart living Mm -hmm. Um, whether you saw, you know, a particular color palette in there, there was a visual component of how this room was set up in an image or whatever it might be, how that might come back later to serve you as a photography business owner. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's really cool. Talk to me about books too. I mean, magazines is one thing. And I, by the way, I love magazines as well. Um, especially like if I'm going through the airport and I have time to just stop at a magazine rack and look for a little bit is really great. I get, I have gotten anyway, a number of magazines over the years, but books, um, also have a significant value or can if we're actually doing something with with that information. Have you found particular inspiration in, in a business or self-help book in the last few years? Yeah. So Big Magic oh. by Elizabeth Gilbert. Yeah. That was definitely one of my favorites. It's been a while since I've read it, but it was just, I guess her her big, you know, the big picture that the book had was huge. The big picture. And how does that relate to your business specifically? She talked a lot about, I believe it was kind of like perfect um, perfectionism okay. and I'm a Virgo. So perfectionism is like my, my thing. And Same. it was very hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in college, I went to school for graphic design. So yeah. my professors were definitely saying, you know, it, yeah, it's perfect, but to you, it may not be. Mm-hmm. So it was one of those where, you know, reading that book, I kind of had to step out of that and be like, okay, you know, this is what, you know, what may not be done for me is, you know, probably done for somebody else, Hmm. I guess, or would be like considered finished. Sure. So it was definitely kind of looking at the the picture there. But again, it's been a few years. It reminds me though, too. And by the way, this is a book we'll make sure to link to it in the show notes. It's been brought up before on on the show. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to read it yet, but but it's the the idea of focusing on the bigger picture context or the bigger picture view as we talk about on the podcast um, is particularly compelling. It reminds me of of something that, that Gary Vaynerchuk uh, talks about or has talked about quite a bit in his content, which is it, it isn't ultimately about the perfection. It's about getting it done. And mm-hmm. you can't do it mindlessly. I mean, he he creates content, an insane amount of content. Of course, thanks in large part to his team, he does it in context. So it's not that you're not thinking as you're creating the content, but trying to get it just so these little nuanced things that we tend to do yeah. as photography business owners at the end of the day don't actually matter in the bigger picture for the sake of driving Mm -hmm. our business forward. And we have to understand that there is a distinction there. And a lot of times it is just about getting it done, doing it well, not perfect. And I love that distinction. For sure. That's a great reminder. We'll make sure to link to that in the show notes for everybody listening in. And by the way, um, we do have, there's actually Haley who produces the podcast, put together this really cool resource um, at, if you go to Boca, B-O-K-E-H, bookshelf.com. 
Um, or Bo- I think recently I made a mistake too. I said Boca Book Club. We have both URLs now, so you can go to either one, but it's a compilation of the more popular books on the podcast for everybody listening in. You can go check those out. Uh, speaking of content too, just a quick side note, we, we are beginning to create video versions of these podcast interviews. What we're going to do with them moving forward kind of remains in the air. You may just see clips of them on social media. We may start posting them in some cases to our Facebook page or pages at the Boca Podcast or Photographer's Edit. Uh, but if if uh, we ever have any opportunity for visual component, the show and tell, if you will, I'll make sure to to highlight that or at least be descriptive for those of you who are just listening to the audio portion of this. But um, just continuing on, you know, our, our the point of our conversation ultimately today centers around something that I saw in a um, a Facebook thread in a private group online. And uh, my friend, Jamie Finley, who has been on this podcast as well, she posted a question. She said, what is everyone doing right now to take precautions and maintain revenue uh, right now with this pandemic? Of course, we're talking about the coronavirus for those of you that may be listening to this sometime later. But she said, let's start a combo to help each other. And uh, you, you jumped in with a comment that was just very proactive in nature. And this is a word I probably overuse at this point. It's, it's partially a reminder for me. I'm preaching to myself that whether it's in the context of the coronavirus and how that affects my company or companies or just in life in general, it's easy. I find it easy to get caught up in negativity internally and let that kind of get me down. And as a result, I step away from that kind of proactive mentality and being consistent in my emotional state and continuing to move forward in my personal life and my business life. And it's detrimental on multiple levels. And so this is something that I'm working on personally, but I, I just have so much respect for those who maintain that approach to life, the proactive approach, rather than sitting back, reacting and letting that trip you up. Um, in this case, Taylor, you did something which was very proactive. And if I can, I just want to read this comment that you posted. Yeah, for you, sure. You said, I started a Facebook group for all of my brides to talk to each other. I felt a few of them. Uh, feeling alone in all of this, it generated a lot of conversation within the group. I also sent Starbucks cards to my brides who are being impacted within the next eight weeks. So far, this put my available dates at the top of their choices. My biggest lesson so far, serve your current clients well, and hopefully it will come back tenfold in recommendations and postponed, and in parentheses, not canceled dates. So I, I want to use this as an opportunity, first of all, as an encouragement for our listeners who might be dealing with, again, a lot of apprehension or fear while their business is slowing down, they're getting cancellations, potentially events rescheduled or sessions rescheduled and encourage them with a very proactive mentality on your part. Have you ever, first of all, just to give context, have you ever experienced a significant downturn in your business over the last few years? I guess I could say I've been pretty lucky to not have, but a lot of times, you know, having self-employed parents, there have been experiences as a kid that I had seen Uh, maybe downturn in either of their businesses and see that they were proactive before. So to me, it's always been if I maybe book less weddings, Mm. I will market my seniors more or I'll market families. Okay. So for that, I guess I have been very proactive, maybe not like knowing it. Sure. You know, luckily I've been pretty, pretty steady with revenue throughout the years. But you had that experience growing up, seeing what it looks like for an entrepreneur to deal with the ups and downs of running their own business to know that you need to occasionally kind of compensate for a downturn, even if it's minor. Mm -hmm. Always having to tweak the business. Yeah. Well, and that's good. It's good just generally to be, uh, I I mentioned this quote, I think it was from uh, Bruce Lee, um, that's become quite popular over the years. He talks about being like water. And and I have this mental picture of, of a stone being dropped in a pond or thrown in a pond. And you see that initial ripple. There's there's a, a kind of a reaction, if you will, mm-hmm. to the, the, the very calm waters being stirred. But very quickly, those ripples go away and it's smooth again. And so when he when I when I think about that quote, um, I think it's a great lesson for life, but it's a particularly important lesson for business owners. And it, it is going, learning how to go with the flow and make adjustments as you go, as you're pointing out, Taylor. I think it's a really great reminder. W- what was your initial response, though, when all of this started to go down in the last week or so with, and I say in the last week, I guess more, had more impact on the economy at large in the mm-hmm. last week or so w- with the coronavirus. What, what was the initial experience for you? What were the initial feelings and thoughts? really trying to stay positive for all of these brides. Um, I have a bride in three weeks. So 
just trying to stay positive for her and listening to all of her things. But I really didn't want to, you know, come out, maybe send emails to everybody to maybe a bride that wasn't, wasn't nervous yet, wasn't even thinking about this. I didn't want to kind of start stirring the pot. So I was just letting those brides reach out to me first and see like, you know, obviously we've had engaged sessions. So we've built that friendship. They know that they can reach out to me for literally anything, but it was really just trying to stay positive in all of this, stay positive for them, and then just see what their questions were and how I could better serve them. Hmm. So that was the first reaction, not necessarily, I guess it was, you know, my husband and I had that conversation and he was like, okay, so what are we going to do? And I was like, I am not going to worry about this until we know whether or not these are postponed or canceled dates. Cause we can sit here and freak out if we don't know, like it's, it's honestly just a waiting game. And I don't think that that's maybe healthy for all of us. Mm-mm. Well, it is. So when you talk about not being healthy, are you talking about the waiting game or the worrying or the combination of both? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the worrying, cause okay. it's just so unknown. So for us to maybe start worrying and start like changing our businesses now, um, for maybe something that, you know, obviously there is the inevitable. We kind of know now we've got eight weeks out where weddings can't, I guess, can't happen. Um, So now we know, you know, okay, those dates are getting postponed. But I think to, you know, last week when we really didn't know what was going on, the CDC hadn't made any recommendations yet. It was kind of like, okay, we could sit here and worry all day long. And, you know, maybe this, maybe everything's going to be fine. So it was just, I don't know, trying to stay in a healthy business state and run the business the way, you know, I've always wanted to, and then figure out what was going to happen later. Well, the two components I think are interesting. When you talk about worry, first of all, we're, you know, we're we're projecting on the future, which is almost psychotic in nature, if we want to be really blunt about it. Um, And by the way, again, preaching to myself there, because I'm I'm certainly guilty of that at times. What you can do is be here. I mean, we talk about, you mentioned meditation earlier. The idea behind meditation is largely just being here, not not thinking like dwelling on the past, not worrying about the future to being here right now. And for any of us who consider ourselves control freaks, the best possible thing you could do is to to focus on what you can actually do right now. And, and that brings me to the to the second point that you made, which is the waiting. If if we if we're sitting around waiting, just reading the news all day long, naturally we're going to get depressed. Naturally, it's going to be debilitating, and we're just going to kind of stop and freeze, uh, and of course worry. So what can we do in the moment that is proactive in nature? And and you exemplified this. So I want to get to that very specifically. Okay. Can you just break down some of the very specific things? I know we, I, I read your post or your comments earlier, but I want to kind of take these one by one, break them down and share these with our listeners. So they at least have some ideas. For sure. Um, and, and maybe this is something that they can begin to implement in their business as well. For sure. For sure. So a few days into this, you know, I had been talking to all these brides. They hadn't heard from venues yet. They hadn't, they didn't really know what was going on, but they all planned on having their wedding day on the same day. And one of the girls posted on Facebook, you know, mm. just saying, we may have to change our date. We're not really sure. And her Facebook post was flooded with her Facebook friends that were like, oh, just split your wedding date up or, you know, just, you can get married this day and reception that day. And I just felt her going, like she was saying, you know, I want to get married and have my reception on the same date. Like, but mm. I want to make sure all my vendors are there and, yeah. You know, she didn't really have anybody that she could communicate with or maybe was going through the same thing. So I thought, okay, you know, I'm I'm sitting there. It's probably like eight o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I need to get all these girls into one room so that they know, Hmm. you know, that they're not alone. And, you know, they're all, I would say, at least two hours apart from every single one of you or like every one of them is at least two hours apart. So it was you know, kind of just gut reaction. Okay, Facebook group, let's do this. Let's let's let them talk to each other, know that they're not alone. And then it really helped because in there they were able to kind of express that, you know, this is the wedding day that they've been wanting since they were little girls. And now it's here. And now they're having to push it from one and a half month to five months away. So it was, you know, huge for them to know, like, I'm not alone. This isn't just me. You know, maybe we can work together to figure out how we're, you know, stepping forward, how we're moving forward. Well, you exemplified leadership there, which is a, a topic in and of itself. But I love that you you saw an opportunity to, again, serve the client, A, create some type of encouragement. And ultimately, that meant creating community. So you start this Facebook group, and you invite them in there. And, and now you all can empathize with and encourage each mm-hmm. other, which is just a, a beautiful thing. 
and, and did you do that? You kind of created like a, fa- a private Facebook group or what did that, how did that process work? Yeah. Yeah. So it's now, um, it's called Taylor Ford photography weddings. Okay. So essentially it's going to end up be for all the brides that I have from here on out. But cool. I, I guess I just want to make this community for them to yeah. now maybe potentially start buying and selling wedding decor after all is said and done. Um, but really just having a group of girls or, you know, whoever a groom is more than welcome to be in there, but yeah. just having people that are going through the same experience, because, you know, when you become, you know, when you get engaged, Pinterest is really there. You've got all of these things, but it's really helpful to just have other people to chat with and see what they're doing, what their what their ideas are, how they're executing things. And then once they make all these decorations, like, you know, do we put them on Facebook Marketplace or how about, you know, we just have a group of 30 other people that we can sell them to. So I love it. And, and I mean, at the end of the day, uh, as much as photography, that the actual images that we create have a certain significance, quite a bit of significance, obviously, the, the experience that you provide your clients is going to make the biggest difference in future business, the referrals that you might get. And taking this action here proactively and creating this group and this community, people are going to not just think of you as a photographer, but a human being, a leader, somebody who actually made a personal difference in their lives. And that is going to be a massive, massive impact on future business. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a really great example for our listeners. Um, what's the next thing that you did? Um, so then I also sent them Starbucks gift cards okay. because in all this planning, you know, you're just so stressed out. Yeah. Like what's better than a latte to help you like, you know, just kind of, or even just taking their fiance out and just having like a date between the two of them at the coffee shop or whatever they want to do. Um, but it was just something like, you know, I could have sent them Jenny's ice cream or whatever, but Starbucks is just, they've got it easy. <laughs> just hop on the app, yeah. send them $10, pops up in their account and they all wrote back and they were like, oh my gosh, you know, what a crazy day. This put the biggest smile on my face. Thank you so much. Mm. You know, it's just in the, in the craziness and the unknown that none of us really know what's going on. Sometimes it's just a small gesture that really helps them kind of, I don't know, regroup and know that everything's going to be fine. I'm still, still getting married. It's just a little time that we all have to be a little bit, of, a little bit selfless and kind of change our, our game. Yeah. I mean, you start by creating community and then you do the thing that they, in, in many cases, might just kind of expect the least, right? Which is to send them a gift. I mean, people are freaking out about money and trying to figure out what's next in their lives personally, professionally. And suddenly this little notification pops up or they get an email that you sent them a gift. And it's so funny. I think I mentioned this on the podcast before, but how little things, I mean, 10 bucks isn't going to hurt us. And the impact that that makes for the clients, their the experience of their day amidst all the, the craziness that we're dealing with is incredible. And not mm-hmm. just right now, but again, in the longer term, when somebody needs a wedding photographer, they're not just going to be like, oh, Taylor was, she took some really cool pictures they're going to just effusively talk about how incredible a human being you are and the experience that you provided for them and how thoughtful you were. And that just makes that much bigger of an impact for them, but ultimately when it comes to actually getting new business down the road. So that's really huge. Anything else that you're doing currently, currently, or that you're, you're thinking about doing in this realm when it comes to creating a a better experience or or just a really great experience for your brides as they're dealing with the stress? For sure. So um, I'm also, I think, you know, as photographers, our time is really kind of what we need to give them. Mm. Um, so, you know, with this, I've only got one bride that wants to split her date up. So um, now I'm going down to Columbus to photograph her ceremony separately from her reception, okay. but I'm not charging her extra just because it's one of those that I think if we serve the clients that are currently in the door, if we serve the income that we already have coming in, they're really who needs taken care of. So I think... I think right now there's so many things that we can be doing as business owners, but it's really serving those people um, in the here and now. So whether that means maybe offering an engagement session just to brighten their mood, if they haven't had an engagement session before, Mm. I think those are huge. I mean, doing albums and things are definitely going to cost us money through our business, but maybe just giving them a session or telling them like, it's totally okay to split your day up. I will be at both of them. No fees, no fees on rescheduled things like that, because this is really out of their hands. Yeah. They, a lot of them have no choice but to reschedule. So it's just, 
listening to what they need and serving them and really just making this experience better than what they ever could have had in the first place. And I think this is a really great reminder. I want to give further context to it. How many weddings and or portrait sessions do you do in a year, just on average? Um, I average about 25 weddings a year, kind of give or take a little bit. Um, So a lot of these brides are having to take Friday receptions or Friday weddings, but seniors, I don't know, maybe 12 a year average. Okay. So not a ton. And and the reason I asked this and ultimately want to give context to the conversation here is time is is an interesting topic. Again, we could spend really multiple episodes talking about this and maybe we can even come back to this at some point, Taylor. But the reality is that most wedding photographers, even full-time wedding photographers actually have quite a bit of time. And if there are certain, you know, different ways that we can utilize that time. I think, unfortunately, in many cases, photographers aren't using their time very efficiently. They, they lack kind of an overarching big picture perspective. And so they're reacting in many cases to whatever might be going around on around them. And as a result, they're spending, you know, let's just say 60 hours a week instead of 30 hours a week, or even 60 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week working on their business, they could work mm-hmm. much more efficiently. What does that translate to? Certainly more time for our, our personal lives, relationships, et cetera. But it also means if we work more efficiently, that we have more freedom, more flexibility to do the, the very thing that you're talking about. Now, we all kind of naturally have extra time right now. So it makes sense that you are dedicating some of that time to take even better care of your clients, to help them feel um, a certain amount of relief and and care that maybe you wouldn't always have the flexibility uh, to give them. But I I think you highlight a brilliant point here, which is that as photographers, we should ultimately looking for ways to utilize our time to serve our clients better. And again, it doesn't take huge amounts of time to make a really big impact because the average business owner isn't providing this kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Um, So I love that you highlight the significance of time. Ultimately, we should be using our time more efficiently as business owners, but we can use some of that time then to serve our clients better. Um, That's a great lesson for us. So community, I, I was taking notes here. Community was kind of where you started gifting and Starbucks is a great way to go about it. There are other gifts that we could give that don't cost a lot that can make a big impact. And then time we can give of our time. Mm -hmm. And, um, especially right now, as we have some extra time, we should be figuring out ways to do just that. I think it's a great reminder for, for all of us. This has been, this has been really good. I I really appreciate you being willing to just kind of jump on last minute and share with us. This is great encouragement. We're going to try to push this episode out as quickly as possible because it's so relevant right now. Um, but we just remind our listeners one more time where they can find you online, follow what you're doing. For sure. Um, Facebook and Instagram, it's Taylor Ford photo. And then my website is taylorfordphotography.com. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll put those in the show notes, bocapodcast.com for everybody listening in, make sure you take advantage of the show notes. Great resource Haley's putting together B O K E H podcast.com. Check it out. Thanks once again, Taylor, for making time for all of us. For sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. <laughs>